who you should call if they're <laughs> if you have any uh, tech issues. I'm about the last <laughs> person. Point. Yeah, yeah, not me um, either. Um, all right, yeah, I think whenever you're ready to rock and roll, I yeah, think we're, man, we're, we're good. Yeah, definitely. I think this is gonna be great. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody. I really uh, appreciate your taking the time out of your day um, to go through and share a little knowledge. Um, my name is Pete McCall. I am an educator and have been working with Derek for a little while now. Um, and, and I really, when I saw his product, is one of those aha moments because I'm like, man, why didn't somebody develop this before? And I'm a big fan of, of core training. You know, my athletic background was I was a rugby player. I played on the front row. I'm pretty competitive, pretty high-level rugby um, here in the States, and I, I uh, suffered a pretty bad back injury, uh, ruptured the disc between L4 and L5, and came back from it. That's when I really started learning about core training and realized that uh, up until that point, um, this was the late 90s, up until that point I had been training um, very inefficiently for the sport I was playing, so I, I learned a lot more about that. Just real quick, this is a picture. This is my idea of core training in action. Um, I am a father to two young girls, and I've really, as I've um, kind of gone into my my 40s, as I've matured in my 40s, as I'm a parent with two young girls, my fitness goals have changed a little bit um, due to uh, more important things in my life. Um, I was never an aesthetic guy to begin with, and I know there's some people with aesthetics who are very important, but I look at core training more as performance. I look at core training more as giving you the ability to enjoy your favorite activities. I look at core training as the foundation for strength for anything you want to do. So uh, what this webinar is not going to be is how to get shredded six-pack abs because um, abs are made in the kitchen. If you, But what we are going to talk about, what I'm going to go into is some of the physiology and some of the anatomy of core training and how you can make your core stronger. This is um, how I sometimes, um, some workouts, I would put both my daughters on, I'd have one daughter in the backpack, as you can see um, on my back, and I'd have the other daughter in the Bjorn, and I'd go for about a two, two and a half mile walk around my neighborhood. I'd pick them up from daycare, and that's how I would carry them around, and that was um, kind of an offloaded training day for me. Um, and that, in my mind, is core training. You know, it's having the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it, so you're not sore the next day. And so with that, that's really going to kind of be our um, my emphasis of the uh, of of today's webinar. So I always like starting with this quote. Um, Peter Drucker is a management um, guy. He was not a fitness guy by any stretch of the imagination. He helped kind of develop our modern corporation back in the 1920s and 1930s. And this was Drucker's quote: "For efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things." And as we can see, there are a lot of trends in fitness. Some of them may or may not be right. I love uh, this picture because you look at it, and at one point, we thought that was a, uh, a successful way to train. But I always look at something as, is, are we doing the right thing, and or is this doing things right? So I always keep that in the back of my mind. Is As you learn about how the body moves, you have to scratch your head a little bit and then take a step back and say, is that exercise? Is that movement using the body the way the body's designed to move? And a lot of times the answer is going to be no. Um, looking at who's stronger, I always have this uh, point up here because when we look at we look at people's bodies, we we have this misconception, and that's exactly what it is: is a misconception, misperception that just because you're ripped does means that you're strong. Um, when we look at Jay Cutler on the right, and and Jay is is an absolutely just outstanding athlete. You do not win a bodybuilding competition like Mr. Olympia um, by just going th through things halfway, and let alone four times. So he trains extremely hard. But when you look at the person on the left, that's Vasily Alexiev, one of the preeminent weightlifting um, stars from the 1970s and early 1980s from the Soviet Union. He was the first one to clean and jerk. He was the first one to lift 500 pounds overhead. He set 80 world records in the snatch and the clean and jerk. And when you look at Alexeyev and you look at Jay Cutler, you might look at Cutler and go, wow, that guy is definitely much stronger than Alexeyev just the way he looks. But um, I doubt very seriously that as strong as he is, Mr. Cutler could probably not clean and jerk 200 pounds, let alone 500 pounds. Um, he is so, you know, Cutler is so muscular that it limits his range of motion. It limits his control. And when you look at Alexeyev, the interesting thing is, and this is how sick the Soviet sports scientists are, is when you look at that gut, that's, that gut does not come from having too many borscht and too many vodkas. That gut was engineered because if anybody knows Olympic weightlifting, that 
part of getting part of the lift is you get the bar up, going up in the air, but then you have to get your body under the bar. So this this gut on Alexeyev was really um, there, kind of um, to help him get down lower underneath the bar quicker. So my argument here is that you know we can't just look at somebody's muscles and say, oh that guy must be strong or that person must be strong. We have to understand that true strength comes from all the tissue, the, the muscle, the skeletal muscle, and the connective tissue working together. And let's be honest, these are the people that we're going to see most of the time in the gym. These are the people coming to us who want to get in shape. I mean, we have to, I think we, we sometimes have this um, this bias. I mean, we just had the Idea World Fitness Conference a couple weeks ago in Los Angeles. And I, I kind of sit there because when I look at this, I, when I look at all the stuff at a trade show like at Idea World, it looks like we're just doing fitness for the fit, but we forget that there's a large majority of people out there who are trying to get healthier, and we're giving them a lot of misinformation. And we're not serving them if we're if we're telling them that you need to train your abs, you need to train your core, you need to do this. You know, because honestly, if people are overweight and need to lose weight, the most important thing is just to move and move consistently. Worry about the details later. But if you're working with people like the two people on your screen, the most important thing is just get them moving. Don't worry about what muscles do. What that that's going to come with time. Just get them moving. Find something they enjoy doing and have them do it as much as they can, without without having discomfort. And the other thing that reason why I have these two pictures is because these are the people we work with. And if they go to the gym and do a program like this, this is a very standard program that you might see a, a quote core training program. I'm giving my air quotes and my fingers on that. Because when you look at this program, you see bent knee sit-ups, you see lateral flexion, you see leg lifts, oblique crunches, stability ball crunch, stability ball twist. When you look at those exercises, you might go, yeah, it's a really, that's a good core training program because it's using all your quote, core muscles. So what this study showed, and you can see the, the where it's from, it, it was uh, released in 2009 from the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. The people in this study did two, work, two sets of this workout. They did 10 reps, two sets five days a week for six weeks. So you had a study group who did that workout five days a week for six weeks. And then you had a control group that did nothing. <laughs> so the study group increased about, they increased endurance of the, of the involved muscles, but there's no difference in ab fat between the two groups. So the group doing that workout five times a week for six weeks, they did that 30 times, did not lower their fat in their abdominal region. So you can't sit there and go, okay, we're gonna do abdominal training and expect the, the size to change. You have to look at other things. That's why the axiom that the abs are made in the, in the kitchen are, is absolutely correct. And when you look at these exercises, these are common exercises for what we traditionally call the core. But my argument is it's not the way the body is designed to move. We are not designed, our body is not designed to flex from the floor. Our abdominal muscles can do that, but you have to take into consideration that we were designed to move our entire system. So. When I, look at, when I look at the ideology of, of how we should be core training, I looked at my, my two daughters. This is a video of my, actually my older daughter. She is, uh, you've seen two things here. And now the video might be choppy, but in the lower picture you see her learning how to roll over. And in the top picture you see her learning how to extend the spine. This is the initial core training. This is what our body wants to do. My daughter is not verbal cognitive at this point, meaning I can't cue her to brace her core, engage your abs, tighten your core, whatever nonsense we might say. I can't cue her to do that. What is she doing? What she's doing in the top picture, she's straightening her spine. She's lengthening her spine. What she's doing in the bottom picture to roll over is she's using her hips and her shoulders together. If you want to know effective core training, you have to engage your hips and your shoulders together. Your hips and your shoulders are connected via your spine. When we move, we're, this is my daughter, the top picture is about two and a half months, the bottom picture is about three and a half months, the bottom video. You learn to move from our earliest ages, we learn to move our entire body together. We do not isolate any individual muscle. The only time we isolate muscle is in the machine designed for muscle isolation. Any other time we move, all of our muscles are moving together. This is my younger daughter. This is my younger daughter at about four and a half, five months, right before she started crawling. And you can see, She's a little more coordinated, and what's, in, what's really important, that the reason why I have this video up, is I want you to see how she's using her hips and her shoulders together. So she's engaging, she's using her hips to roll over on her front, and you see she's starting to push up on her arms and her shoulders. But this is how our brain, again, she's not verbal cognitive, she's about six months here, 
She can't think about this. This is just pure reactivity. She is reacting. She is initiating movement from her hips. So when we look at these cues in the bottom of the screen, these cues come from Chuck Wolf. Chuck encourages people to keep your spine long. We want to increase length in the spine. We want to move from the hips, and that's what exactly what my daughter is doing here. I can't cue that to. I can't cue that. She is naturally moving from the hips, and she's integrating her shoulders and her hips because when you look at our core muscles, our core muscles connect. Our shoulders and our hips connect via the spine and via our core muscles. So if we want really effective core training, we have to look at how do we use our hips and our shoulders together because it's going to involve all the muscles in between. So just watch. If you have a young child, if you have a baby, if you, whether there's a relative, watch how that baby moves. And honestly, it'll get you questioning everything you may have been taught about core training. Because when we look at what influences movement, we have to take a step back. And this is a, you know, a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Terminator. In this movie, he played a cybernetic organism. He played a robot. And when you look at what a robot is, a robot has hardware and a software, and, it, and, and the software tells the robot how to move. That's, in essence, what we are. As humans, we are cybernetic organisms. Our hardware is our muscle tissue and our skeletal structures. So our muscle, our connective tissue, our skeletal structures, that's all the hardware. Our software is our nervous system. That's what tells the hardware to move. So anytime that you're working with a client, you have to take a step back when you're doing an assessment going, is it a hardware issue or is it a software issue? If it's a hardware issue, that's a medical issue. If there's something wrong with the muscle tissue, if there's something wrong with the skeletal structure, that's outside the scope of practice with a fitness professional. They need to see a medical professional to get that fixed. But if it's a movement issue, meaning they don't have coordinated movement, then it's a software issue, and that's within our scope of practice. When you look at that, I don't know how many people studied computer programming back in the day. I think everything now is point and click. But once upon a time, GIGO um, in computer programming stood garbage in, garbage out. If you write bad software, the computer will not do what you want it to do because a computer reacts to the software. That is exactly how the body works. The body is a hardware system. It will react to how it's trained. If you train in muscle isolation, you do not train all how you're not training the entire body to move together as a single unit. So whenever you start working with the client, you need to assess them for their movement skills and try to determine is it a hardware issue outside my scope of practice, refer to a medical professional, or is it a software issue? Can I help them train more effectively? That is completely within our scope of practice. Now, interesting term here is mechanotransduction. Little did you know, so you didn't realize it when you're a personal trainer that you're a computer programmer, but that's exactly what you are. Well, you're also a chemical engineer because any mechanical force in your body, any mechanical force introduced to your body, gravity, external resistance, rubber band, weights, any mechanical force produces a chemical response. Your muscle tissue gets stronger because your satellite cells react and they help the muscle fibers grow denser. So when you, when you do strength training, it creates a response, and your satellite cells your satellite cells are those little microscopic structures that build up new cells in your body. So any force applied to your body is going to trigger a response to get stronger. Your muscle gets stronger, your bone gets stronger, and what's happening is it's layering down new cells to make it stronger. So when you apply force to the body, you're changing the chemical structure of the body. Then biotensegrity is a term that stands for the, that refers to the balance between tensile and compressive forces. When you look at an architectural structure, there's a balance between tension, which is lengthening, and compression, which is shortening. Well, what do our muscles do? Our muscles do two actions. They lengthen and they shorten. So our body is a biotensegrity structure. It is a balance between lengthening, the forces of lengthening and shortening, tensile being lengthening, compressive being shortening. Our bones float within our fascial web. So you know, we, we used to have this you know, idea of the bones support the muscles. But if you, if you take a really hard look at it, and I think it was Graham um, Sklar who wrote this in the book by Tensegrity, if you take a hard look at it, the muscles actually support the skeletal structures. And so we look at how the bones float within the fascial web. Why is that important? Because when it comes to program design, we need to consider how everything moves together. So here I am demonstrating a lateral lunge with a rotation. So this is, and I'm reaching at different heights. What I'm doing is I'm involving my hips and my shoulders. And you can see that as the t-shirt stretches, that's a good indication of how your muscle and connective tissue stretches. So when you lunge and you're reaching across at different heights and different directions, 
you're lengthening the tissue. Our muscles actually get stronger when we lengthen them. We spend so much time shortening muscles, we're going to contract that muscle, contract that muscle. But in reality, when you lengthen a muscle, you're creating tensile force in the muscle. You're creating, you're training the muscle how to add collagen, and you're making the muscle stronger as it lengthens. So for those of you who have worked with clients that have had chronic issues with muscle pulls, or little muscle injuries, take a look at their program and are they doing a lot of concentric force production? I mean, are they focusing a lot on shortening the muscle? If so, then the, you're not training the muscle how to absorb the forces that transmit through it. What we want to try to do with effective training strategies is we want to try to lengthen the muscle. We want to try to find ways to lengthen the muscle under resistance, and what that will do is help make help give you stronger structures. So this is now a Turkish getup. And these videos were taken in Balboa Park, by the way, in San Diego. So Turkish getup is a great exercise because you're integrating everything together. The reason why I have this in here is because just like my daughters learn how to move by rolling on the ground, when you lay on the ground, you automatically kind of reset your nervous system. When you're laying on the ground, it's kind of like a you, you reset everything. Your spine is straight. Your spine is, spine is not supported. And what you're doing is I'm giving you just a little couple of cues about the, the exercise there. But what the Turkish Kidup does is you're training your hips and your shoulders how to work together. So when we look at how the hips move, we look at how the shoulder moves, all that tissue in between is being lengthened. So right now the abdominals, the obliques, the um, transverse abdominis, the rotatory muscles, longimus, longissimus muscles in the back, the multifidi muscles, everything is being lengthened under resistance. And now the additional challenge of the, of the active motion bar is that because there's a shifting mass, 30% of each active motion bar has a shifting mass. Because there's a shifting mass, it requires more stability to hold that, to keep that relatively stable. You can see how it's a little bit of a challenge. That's only a 15-pound bar, but it does significantly increase the challenge of a Turkish get-up. But this is really, in my mind, this is effective core training. So remember, remember what I said at the beginning. I do not train for the beach. My goal is not to get six-pack abs, because obviously I don't got them. But what I can do is I can carry a lot of weight. I can lift a lot of weight without a weight belt, and I have no residual effects from having blown out a, a ruptured a, a disc between two vertebrae. Um, about 17 years ago. So that's why I train. I train to be strong. I train to move. And when we look at the muscles, you know, I have, I have these images here of muscles. We generally tend to think of muscles as discrete units. You know, this is from um, a series of a CD-ROM of all the individual muscles. We look at all these individual muscles and we say, well, this muscle starts here and there and they all connect. But in reality, when we move, all tissue works together. If you were to sit up nice and tall right now and you reach across your body, so sit up tall, reach across your body with your left hand, you would feel how your chest muscles are working, your shoulders are working, your back muscles are working. Everything moves together. So when we develop exercise strategies for our clients, we have to keep in mind that it is a fallacy. It's not accurate to say we can exercise only one muscle at a time. But instead, we want to have a way for how do we train the entire system. You know, this is from um, Tom Myers. You know, if you haven't read Anatomy Trains by Tom Myers, see if you can get a hold of that. Tom Myers has a lot of YouTube videos up that goes through this. But Tom Myers, Thomas Myers' Anatomy Train concepts is that all of our tissue is connected. You can see his front functional line here. The image on the left is your pectoralis major, your rectus abdominis, and your adductor. Um, that looks like da -da -da, not the magnus, but the adductor uh, da -da -da, not brevis. Um, the adductor longus. So that's your pec major, um, your anterior deltoid, your rectus abdominis, and adductor longus all linked together. And what he does is he, he organizes the muscle in terms of how they shift force through the body. That's exactly what muscle does. So if you stood up right now, if you stood up right now, and now you took your left arm again and reached across your body, if you do that, you will feel how your hip rotates. If you reach your left arm across your body, you'll feel how you create internal rotation at the hip. You create external, you create internal rotation at your left hip, and you create. Um, if you reach your left hand across the body, sorry, I need to just face. I usually face the audience. If you reach your left hand across the body, you create internal rotation at your right hip and external rotation at your left hip. Reach your right arm across the body, you just change the rotation of the hips. So that gives you another example of just you know from what you did as a baby on the ground we stand and when we move, our shoulders and our hips connect to one another and move together. These are two other images. You have the back, um, superficial back line on the left, which is your erector spinae, your biceps femoris, that's your gastrocnemius. 
I don't know how many of you would consider the gastroc a core muscle, but the gastrocnemius connects, you know, the gastrocnemius connects down at the bottom of the femur. The femur, the superior attachment of the femur, the thigh bone, connects at the pelvis. Because the gastroc attaches to the femur, the gastroc influences motion at the hip. So yes, your calf muscle can be considered a core muscle. If you have a tight calf, if you, if, you know, from wearing a certain pair of shoes, from overtraining, if you have a tight calf, it can throw off movement at the hip. If it throws off movement at the hip, it changes the movement of the rest of your body. The back functional line on the right shows how the glutes are tied in with your, um, that's your vastus lateralis of your quadriceps, your glutes, and then your big latissimus dorsi. So anytime you lengthen the muscle, you're strengthening it. And we want to have strategies for when we train. If we're really trying to help our clients, we want to have strategies for how can we lengthen the muscle under resistance because that can be the most effective way to stretch it. And this is, just, I'm going to go back to this. So that's, a, that's what the tissue looks like in your body. So I juxtapose that because when you look at the, the textbook pictures, you see all these nice, neat, discrete sections of muscle. But if you've ever done a cadaver study, you open the muscle, you open the body up, guess what? It's not organized like that. It's organized in layers. There's tissue on top of tissue on top of tissue. It's not nice, discrete images like you see in a textbook, but it's, it's layers. And how you use your body will, will, will directly determine how your tissue layers across one another. So if you are stuck in place, if you don't move much, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, guess what? Your tissue stucks, binds together, and restricts movement in your joint. So one of the most important things we can do for our clients and get them up and moving, move in all planes of motion, move in all directions, and most importantly, move with variable loads. You know, we have this idea that we want to teach perfect form. Perfect form is okay to a degree, but we can actually do a better service for our clients by having some variation in the repetitions, by having some variation in the movement, because that puts different force through the tissue. And this is now the hoop tension of our core muscles. That's looking down. So the bottom of the image is your spine, your rectus spinae, and your um, iliopsoas muscles. You know, you see the vertebra looking down the vertebra. The front is your um, those two little bulbs that bulges in the front is your is your uh, rectus abdominis. But what I'm showing you, why I'm showing you this is that your core muscles are like layers of plywood. They're all layers that layer right on top of one another. That's how your tissue works in the body. They're not discrete units, but they have layers of muscle sliding across one another. If you don't move the muscle, the layers bind, and that's where knots and adhesions come in. So you want to be able to move the muscle in order to have the layers slide successfully across one another. And when we look at the different types of tissue, muscle is the contractile element. Muscle generates force. Fascia is elastic, and that transmits force. So when we do training, we need to have a balance. We need to have some exercises that do work on force production, that do work on concentric force production, but then we also have to have other exercises that lengthen the tissue, just like I showed you with that lateral lunge with rotation. Now, when we get to teaching movement, we have to respect the fact that exercise is a function of movement. I'll say that again, exercise is a function of movement. Exercise is not just a, you know elbow doing this, or knee doing this, or hip doing this. If we're doing it right, we're training our clients how to move better. We're training our clients how to walk better. We're training our clients how to climb better. We're training our clients how to do whatever it is they want to do in their day. We're training them how to move better to be successful in their day. So when you look at it, we have three stages of motor learning. Initials when you're learning the movement. The video of my, of my daughter's, the first video of my daughter, was their initial stage of motor learning for learning how to crawl. They're pushing up through the spine. They're rolling over. Now, that, that second video, or or the third video where my daughter's rolling over pretty easily, that's the developmental stage. That's where she's learning how to control it on her own. And then finally, we get to the reflexive moment. So the stages of motor learning we're working with the clients, we teach them the initial steps of doing a movement. Then we let them practice it on their own. And then, as trainers, we want our clients to have the reflex so they don't have to contract their abs. Because try this real quick. Try this real quick. I want you to contract your abs as tight as you can. Brace your abdominal muscles, contract your abs, tighten your core, whatever phrase you want to use, tighten your abs, now try to stand up. You can't do it. Or if you're standing up, tighten your abs, contract your abs, squeeze your glutes, tight, tight, tighten. Now try to walk. Try to sit down. You can't do it because if you're cognitively contracting those muscles, you're restricting motion in certain segments of the joint. So to sit there and give people cues of tighten your core, tighten your core, 
is sending wrong information to the brain. The right muscles will create the right stability when it is needed. Movement is reflexive. Our brain is organized so that the muscles turn on subconsciously to allow our brain to pay attention to other things. This goes back to our roots. When you're walking through, you know, when you're walking through the plains a number of years ago, if you lived out west a number of years ago, and you're traveling from east to west on the, on the wagon train, you need to, when you're walking through the trail, you can sit there walking down the trail thinking, okay, tighten my abs, tighten my abs, squeeze my glutes. You had to keep your eye out for what's in front of you because you had to see if there's something that was going to eat you or you're looking for something to eat. You know, is there going to be, is there going to be, you know, a big cat in the, in this, in the grass? When we have some of that in the southwest here, is there going to be a snake on the ground? Is there going to be, you know, is there going to be a coyote looking for a dinner? So your brain is busier with other things, and it doesn't have time to pay attention to contracting muscles, so it works at the subconscious reflexive level. So our goal as a trainer is to put our clients in the right position so the right muscle turns on at the right time without our client having to think about it. So yes, we can give the, the client some cues at certain points to say, contract your abdominals and, and, and brace your core so they understand what that feels like. But as they progress in their training, we do not want to give that cue. We don't want to tell people to tighten their core. We want to tell people to move. We want to tell people to keep their spine long. But the, if, you're, if we are doing the right program with our client, the core will turn on. Those muscles will turn on automatically. I really try not to say core, and I really I get mad at myself anytime I say engage your core if I'm teaching a movement class because that just it's not telling me anything. And when we look at this, think about walking. So those those videos earlier, my daughter's learning how to crawl. Walking is the default operating system of the body. If our body, if the muscles in the skeletal structures are the hardware, and our nervous system is our software. Walking is our default operating system. So whether you're a Mac with iOS, iOS version, whatever they're uploading this week, or whether you have a um, PC with whatever Microsoft 10 and whatever it is now, or Windows 10, whatever it is now, that is the software that drives the hardware of the computer. Walking, the gait cycle, is the basic foundational software of human movement. When you see my daughter extend her spine, when you see my daughter roll over, those are the initial phases of synchronizing the hips and the shoulders together for walking. We learn how to walk when we're somewhere between like 9, 10, and maybe 14, 15 months old. After that, walking becomes reflexive. If you have a young kid, you, you remember when your, when your toddler first learned to walk, you saw how uncoordinated they were, uncoordinated how you know, kind of jerky they were. As they got better, they went from developmental to reflexive. Now when you walk, your brain is not thinking about what it's doing. When you take a step, you're not thinking abs, core, glutes. You're not doing that. But what you're getting is you're getting rotation. That right leg swings forward, your left arm swings forward. Your, right le your left leg swings forward, that right arm swings forward. Your pelvis and your thoracic spine counter-rotate against one another. So your left leg is swinging forward, the right arm is swinging forward. The right leg is swinging forward, the left arm is swinging forward. Our body is designed to rotate in the transverse plane to move forward in the sagittal plane. So let's come back to what I said earlier. Good core training integrates motion between the shoulders and the hips, just like we do when we're walking. If we go back to walking as our default operating system, don't work against the operating system, work with it. Break down the patterns of walking and tell, tell people how to do it more successfully. Stuart McGill, I'm going re, to refer to Stuart, some of Stuart McGill's research, but Stuart McGill's um, research indicates that this is a farmer's carry, carrying you know, heavy loads in either hand. That can be one of the most successful core training moves movements you can do. You look at those bodybuilders, take a look, you know, the gander, that little old lady carrying those two big baskets of watermelon. Well, I can guarantee you she has never done a crunch in her life, but her core is probably much stronger than those three guys because if she's been carrying that type of load every day, every time she steps on with one foot, her body automatically has to stabilize. So if you really want to help your clients get, develop a stronger core, think about how you can add carries. Farmers carries, which is one weight in each hand, or a suitcase carry, which is one weight in one hand, and add that into the system. If you want to make it really interesting, put a long bar with a shifting mass in their hand and see if they can maintain control of the bar and try to keep it relatively level while they're walking. You can't cue them how to do it. Their brain has to do it reflexively. So you know, doing this type of carried exercise, what you're going to do is you're going to enhance coordinated movement and you're going to help improve overall stability as a reflex. The brain wants the body to be stable, so it's going to do it automatically. 
You don't need to give too many cues. You just need to create the right environment. So when we look at fundamental movement skills, we have locomotor skills, running, jumping, hopping, skipping. All those emanate from crawling. You can't run unless you can crawl successfully. So if you really, if you have clients that are really uncoordinated, if you have clients that really just, no matter what, they don't seem coordinated, regress them, get them back down the ground, teach them how to roll over, teach them how to crawl. I know that sounds silly, but it works. You're rebooting the system. The first thing you do when you call tech support, if Derek and I were really having a hard time getting the web, web, webinar up and running and we call tech, tech support, what's the first thing they usually tell you to do? Unplug and plug in your computer. You reboot the system. Rolling on the ground and crawling on the ground reboots the system, the nervous system. So when you roll on the ground, if you have a client roll on the ground, if you have a client crawl on the ground, it goes back to when they're six, seven, eight, ten months old before they learned how to walk. Their reason, you're not using gravity. Gravity's taken out of the picture. The ground is supporting you. You're rebooting the system. Object control skills, you're catching, throwing, kicking, bouncing. Stability skills, balancing, twisting, rotation. That's all walking. Walking is your balancing left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, while your, your thoracic spine and your pelvis is twisting and rotating. So that's what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to create those environments for our clients so that it becomes more successful. Some of the better, you know, some of the better core exercises you can do are single leg balance. You know, it's funny, I used to, I teach core training classes and I used to teach it was it was called core training. And people come in and the first eight minutes of the class is spent on a single leg balance. And every now and then you get people walk out and I'm fine with that because they're like, well, I thought this was core training. And my reaction is it is. Because if you're balanced on one leg, what muscles are creating that stability? The core muscles. And it goes back to inherent stability. The reason why, why, uh, we working with active, why I'm working with active motion bar is active motion creates that inherent instability. So our body wants to be stable. This is ways that you can hold the active motion bar. It's showing, uh, those are images in the bottom, it's showing you can have a balance grip in the left, you can use a single hand grip in the right, you can use an offset grip, um, sorry, you can have a bilateral grip on the left picture, you can have a single hand grip with the middle picture, then you can have an offset grip in the right picture, and this is an image of, the, of this is a video of the benefit of an offset grip. So right there I'm using an offset grip with the uh, active motion bar, and what it's doing, what I'm doing with it is I'm allowing you know, I'm allowing that weight to shift into that hip. So as I lunge back, so as I lunge back into the hip, I am loading the weight into the hip. The mass of the active motion bar is shifting. So as I step back, I am adding more load into the glutes. I am lengthening the glute. I am lengthening the fascia more, creating more load. So this isn't the benefit of you using an offset grip. It creates more load and more strength in a particular regional muscle. Because as I'm stepping back and the hip is flexing, as the hip is flexing, the glute muscles which extend the hip are being lengthened. So right now that is lengthening the muscle under resistance, which is a one way to make the muscle stronger. And because there's a shifting mass in the active motion bar, I can load that side more versus the other. So that's just a uh, reverse lunge and offset grip. Now lengthening the strength is you want to keep tissue, you want to keep tissue long and under resistance. You really want to keep tissue long under resistance. So by redoing the reverse lunge with my arms overhead, I'm really lengthening the abdominal fascia. And if you remember our anatomy, I had that picture of the rectus abdominis up earlier. We don't really have an upper and lower abdominal, but we do have a right and our left. Our rectus abdominis muscles divide into right and left halves. So right there on this, this section of the video, I'm doing more of a right abdominal. Now I'm doing left abdominal. And what's one of the common exercises? One of the more common exercises, one of, sorry, what's one of the common injuries? A common injury right now is a sports hernia. A sports hernia is a strain of the abdominal muscle down at the hip. And that's because the muscles lengthen. If all you do is crunch, if you're crunching, 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 we're going to see this. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to get NFL camps are opening up. And I guarantee you we'll have a couple of players go down with either abdominal strains or high hernia. Is usually called one or the other. If you're doing crunch, 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 and you're working on the concentric action of the muscle, you're not training the muscle how to lengthen under force. This type of reverse lunge is much more successful for lengthening the tissue and creating more tensile strength so the tissue is stronger as it's lengthened. Trying to keep the arms overhead is very challenging and trying to keep the bar level. The cool thing about the active motion bar is it gives you direct, in, direct feedback about whether you're keeping the level. If you hear the balls rolling, you're not doing a good job of maintaining the level. So that gives you an idea. 
Now, when it comes to strength and conditioning, when it comes to training, I always ask one or two questions. You know, I look at, this is a, a little Venn diagram I started playing with a little while ago. Um, this is a little Venn diagram I started playing with a little while ago. And you have to look at any training outcome. At any training outcome, we're either trying to do work on a skill or we're trying to work on conditioning. Skill is you're trying to improve some type of specific motor skill. Conditioning is you're trying to improve your overall energy capacity, your ability to do work. So there is some overlap between skill and conditioning. But if you're doing really high intensity work, you're not doing skill work. And if you're doing skill work, you do not need to do high intensity work. Because if you're doing skill work, you want to keep your intensity low so you can learn the skill. So that's why if I'm working with somebody on speed, I am giving them an adequate rest interval between the reps because I want them to learn the patterns to be faster. Now, if I'm conditioning them, it's different. I'm going to give them a shorter rest interval because I'm working on the energy pathway. I'm working on the metabolic response. I'm looking at the oxygen demands. I'm looking at the cardiac output. So we always have to, when you, whenever you start a training, whenever you start a training session, so whenever you start, whenever you start a training session, you always have to ask yourself, am I working on skill or am I working on conditioning? Because if you're working on skill, you want longer rest intervals. If your goal is conditioning, you can shorten the rest intervals. You can take away the rest intervals, but understand the skill and the movement quality will go down. Because as fatigue occurs, movement skill diminishes. So that's one of my suggestions, is you look at what are you trying to train with your clients. And when you teach somebody a movement, you're teaching them a skill. So when you first work on the initial phases of movement, you want to make sure you have rest, recovery, all that built in there so they develop the skill of moving better. As they move better, guess what? You can start working on conditioning, moving more often. But if you try to start conditioning without having ad adequate skill, I guarantee you're setting up chances for injury. So this is in some more, going to jump back into Stuart McGill's work. This is from uh, core training for low back disorders. When you're training the muscles that control the movement around the center of gravity, what we commonly call the core, you want motor control in all conditions. Derek, in this, in this picture, Derek, is, this is another great exercise. Derek is doing a lunge with one arm overhead, so he's really lengthening all the tissue on the right side of the body while he's trying to maintain stability through the active motion bar. We want to create variety in tasks and exercises because we want to demand that we want to stress the tissue in different ways. We want to impose different types of demand on the tissue. If we do the same repetitive motion over and over and over again, we create a pattern overload which creates a point of injury. So we want to have some variety in tasks and exercises. That doesn't mean give your client a different workout every time, but what it does mean is you can allow some variation. Like that side lunge with reach, I'm reaching at different heights. That variation will stress the tissue differently. Anytime you have anybody doing flexion rotation exercises, the movement should come from the hips, not the spine. Our lumbar spine is not designed to rotate. A great way to, to create injuries is to try to get the lumbar spine to do something it's not designed to do. The structures of the lumbar spine allow more flexion and extension in the sagittal plane and very minimal rotation in the transverse plane. So if you're rotating through the lumbar spine, you've got to rotate at the hips. You've got to make sure you're getting internal and external rotation at the hips. Have your clients try to get up and stand on a regular basis because prolonged sitting compresses the tissue around the hip joints. That's why a lot of people have tight hips and tight hips ultimately lead to sore low back. So training strategies, we're trying to create co-contraction of muscles. You remember that picture of the abdominal wall? We're trying to get all four layers of that wall to work together. We're not trying to isolate one muscle. That's, that's silly, especially with a lot of our clients. Our clients, if you're working with a bodybuilder that can train six days a week, do split routines, cardio, you know, fasted cardio in the morning, strength training in the afternoon, that's completely different. But for 95% of the average population who's trying to exercise to get in better shape and feel better and be healthier, we need to look at how we get more muscles working together. We're not isolating. We're trying to integrate. I love this quote down at the bottom. We're looking at stability as a moving target that changes as a function of the torque. Torque is a rotational force. So stability is a moving target that changes as a function of moving forces to support various loads. Think about it when you carry a kid. Think about it when you're carrying groceries. You do not have a stable load. And here's a little, here's a little thinker. You guys can meditate on this tonight. The only time we ever lift something up and put it right back where we got it is in the gym. And when we're working out, we pick up a weight, we set it right back down. If you're at home and you pick something up, a box, a bag, a kid, you're usually carrying it somewhere. You carry it from point A to point B. If you're at work and you pick something up, you're carrying it from point A to point B. 
you get something at your car, you're not getting it out of the trunk and putting it right back in the trunk. You're getting it out of the trunk and taking it into the house or taking it to a store. We're moving, we're moving load through gravity, is what Michelle Dalcourt says, is we're, we're shifting weight, we're shifting mass. And that's ultimately what we don't train. We miss that in many of our training programs. We're not looking at how we train through gravity. So this is from a uh, Stuart McGill's um, 2010, a great piece in the Strength, uh, uh, Strength and Conditioning Journal. Um, the stages of exercise program design. First, if you have corrective exercise issues, address them. If there is a software issue, if somebody cannot move right, if they, if they cannot stabilize right, that is where you can say contract your core. That's a very, very appropriate cue. But after that, you know, the, it should be doing it automatically. So stage one is corrective and therapeutic exercise. Stage two is create groove appropriate and perfect the motion and movement patterns. Teach people how to move. Most people cannot hip hinge. We need to teach people how to hinge from the hips with a stable spine. I teach a couple exercise classes and as always, every time I, I, I teach certain patterns, I go, let's do a hip hinge first, stable spine, move from the hips, move your butt back, push your hips forward, butt back, hips forward. So we need to groove the appropriate patterns and perfect movement as the second phase. Then we want to build whole body stability. We want mobility at the hips with stability at the lumbar spine. Stage four is we increase endurance, the ability to sustain work. Endurance is the ability to sustain work over an extended period of time. Strength is the ability to generate more force. You know, when we add force and time, more force and less time, that's power. So we really need to create, so if you look at the six stages here, identified by McGill, we need to create stability first. We need to teach people how to move. Once we teach them how to move, then we can build endurance, then we can build strength, then we can build power. I think we make a huge mistake. When people come in and, and first work out, all right, we're gonna have you throw a medicine ball, that is a recipe for disaster because if somebody cannot stabilize first, there's no way they can generate the force to move a, a medicine ball. So here are other training strategies. We want to create stiffness at the spine. We want the spine to be able to handle and pose loads. Now, machines can break up this integration. You know, machines create unbalance because you're isolating force at one joint. doesn't mean you never use machines, but you have to understand that machines have a limitation. If you're trying to help somebody develop total body strength, we need to do it out of the machines. The machines like the icing on top or the cherry on top of the sundae. Somebody should only do a machine when they have really good movement skill and they're just trying to refine a certain muscle. But if we're just trying to help people move better, move more successfully, move injury free, we need to work with all the muscles at the same time. So the idea of vertical core training, we use our core when we walk, when we're upright moving against the ground. So therefore, we need to have exercise strategies that engage those muscles as a reflex when we're standing on our feet. This is a great exercise where you're moving through the hips, and by shifting the mass of the bar, you're creating more of a demand. You can see the shirt, the woman in the front with that, with that tank top. Those lines in the shirt represent stretching being done, the abdominal muscles. Same with the gentleman in the gray shirt. Those lines that demonstrate the muscle being stretched. We want the muscle lengthened under resistance. That's how we develop stronger tissue. Now, real quick, um, McGill's also done some interesting research on strongman training. So when we look at strongman training, they can handle a super amount of loads. You know, they can, you know, by the math, the reason why McGill's been researching this is when you do the math on this, the amount of force they're putting through the spine, mathematically, it should be buckling the spine and breaking the spine. But strong men and strong women have developed the sufficient strength to be able to work against that. And what are the strategies they use? They integrate the hips and the shoulders. They increase strength to the postural muscles. And muscle recruitment patterns means when muscle, one muscle is firing, other muscles are turning off to allow that muscle to recruit. So McGill's strongman training shows that the body wants to be strong and stable. So when we look at core training for real life, we need to say, how can we train with an unstable mass? How do we create more shifting, more variability through our body? Because if we're always doing the same thing over and over again, we're putting the same lines of force in our body. Now, when Active Motion Bar had a study done at the University of Michigan, and they found that training with a shifting dynamic mass created 170% more activation than a standard weight bar, because they're looking at all the tissue between your muscles. Standard weight bars will work on the skeletal muscle, the individual muscle fibers, but a shifting mass like the Active Motion Bar or work on the fascia and connective tissue between the muscle fibers. That's where real strength comes from. So this is another exercise. I'm doing a forward lunge with a back lunge, and I'm shifting the mass. So as the mass shifts, as the weight comes down, 
the weight is loading into the hip. So I'm loading my left hip, I'm loading my right hip. I am, the hips and the shoulders are moving together. Just like when you're walking. When you're walking, your right hip and left shoulder move and your left hip and right shoulder move. So by using a shifting mass forward and back, I'm creating more strength between the tissue. This is an old-fashioned bent press. This is, a, this is from the late, late 1800s, late 19th century, the strongman training. What you're doing is you're using your hips and your spine together. You're trying to move, you're trying to flex forward at the hips, trying to get the load in the hips while extending your arm overhead. Trying to do that with an unstable bar like the active motion bar requires more activation. And again, hips and shoulders. Anything that gets your hips and shoulders moving against one another is going to create more strength to the system because you're lengthening the tissue. So finally, to, to wrap up here, if you must crunch, and, and I get it, our clients are paying for a workout. We have to give our clients what they need along with what they want. And most clients, you can do all types, you can spend 52 minutes of doing all types of lengthening exercises where shoulders are going one way, hips are going another, and all the tissues being lengthened. But if they don't crunch, their, little, their lower lip is going to tremble, their eyes are going to start to get a little watery, and they're going to look at you, but we didn't do any core work today. So if you must crunch, this is from a great review by Brad Contreras, um, sorry, by Brent Contreras and Brad Schoenfeld, to crunch or not to crunch. They went through hundreds of research on the, on, on the abdominal muscles. What they found is that spinal flexion may play a role in disc hydration, so some spinal flexion is good. But high volume protocols have little functional applicability. Most training is core training, meaning that most training standing up is going to engage your core muscles. And that's what I always tell clients is, you sit all day at work. I don't let you sit during the workout. We do most of our exercises. We might warm up on the ground because I'm resetting your nervous system. But once we start training, you're on your feet, you're moving on your feet. You have 23 hours a day to sit down. You're not sitting down with me. You're not paying me to sit down. And you're certainly not paying me to have you lie down because lying down is a sedative and shuts down your nervous system. But if people must crunch, try to avoid it within an hour of waking or prolonged sitting. Because when you sleep, your actually discs increase in size. So it changes your intervertebral inter pressure. And keep the repetitions down. The bottom line is you want about six to, six to 15 reps per set. That's if you're doing it loaded. So this is great guidelines from, from, uh, from Brent Contreras and Brad Schoenfeld that went through the research. So if your clients do want to crunch, give them two or three sets of 10 crunches. It's not going to kill them. But under, let them know that everything else they did is what's going to give them a strong core. If they, really want, if they really want abs, they have to go back and do some work in the kitchen. When we do core training, we want to follow the variables for strength training. Because a lot of our core muscles, the obliques, hips, um, glutes, hamstrings, adductors are type 2 fibers. So it's, the type 2 fibers ha have a better response to a heavier load with fewer repetitions. And what you're going to do is you're going to improve um, myofibular hypertrophy, meaning the dense, density and thickness of the muscle fibers. So building a workout, you always want to, you know, you look at your, the goal of the workout. Are you working on skill? Are you working on conditioning? Is the goal of your workout, are you working on the contractile element, meaning the active myosin? Are you working on elastic? I mean, I want you to have a, a workout where you're doing a lot of movement, where you're really lengthening the tissue. And you have to build a foundation. So building a foundation with stability, you need that. And that can be part of your warm-up. You know, my argument with, with clients when they first start training is like, why are we doing these exercises? And what I tell them is I'm laying a foundation. You don't build a house by picking the, the, the curtains out first or by picking your exterior color first. You build a house by laying the foundation and framing the structure. That's exactly what you're doing with, with leg, single leg balances, with planks, with bridges. You're building the foundation. When you get more advanced, when you start doing bounding patterns, chop patterns, lift patterns, that's when you're using all the tissue together. So start the workouts, work on the stability first before you go into strength in, in the power training. So, Here's my argument for a three-day split. One, force production. That's where you're doing strength training, power training, whatever training you're doing, you're doing something with heavy, heavy force. That's where you do your compound lifts. You use your hips and shoulders. Day two is core training. That's where you're doing multiplanar movement. Core training, this is the place where I love using my active motion bar because now I'm doing a little bit lighter load. It's kind of like an active recovery. I'm stressing all the connective tissue. When I do heavy lifting, it's using primarily skeletal muscle. Core training, I'm really trying to get the connective tissue and integrating the hips and the shoulders. So it's a little bit less intensity, but getting everything working together. Day three is I'm doing some type of energy system training. Am I doing endurance? Am I doing power? Am I doing speed? And you've got to look at what your clients need. 
if I'm working with a client, the days that I'm going to be working with them are going to be days one and two. But day three, I'm going to have them take a, I'm going to have them take a cycling class. I'm going to have them take a Zumba class. I'm going to have them maybe take some type of class. If they don't like running on their own, I'm going to have them take some kind of class where they get the energy system work I know they're going to get. Or if I'm working on them strength, I want them taking yoga or Pilates or dance classes for the second day core training because that's going to get their entire body moving. And keep in mind appropriate progressions. With every client, certain things are appropriate, certain things are not. You do not give a 16-year-old kid the keys to a Porsche Carrera. The kid will kill himself. He just will. He doesn't know how to handle the speed. Some of these exercises are very advanced. You do not give advanced exercises to new clients. When you have a 16-year-old kid, you give him the 1972 Volvo station wagon, or you give him the 1988 Honda Accord. You give him a slow car to learn how to drive before they go handle the car with speed. Same thing with exercises. The appropriate exercise for your appropriate level of ability. All this stuff was cutting edge back in the 1800s. All we're doing is we're going through. We have a better understanding now of how this works. We look at how the strong man train, how the strong men train of the era of physical culture from the late 19th century to early 20th century. Is they train this way: hips and shoulders together. All these lifts: a single arm press on the left, that's a bent press on the right. All these lifts train the hips and the shoulders together. So I really want to appreciate, I really want to say thank you to Derek and, and Active Motion Bar for inviting me to share some ideas with you today. Um, if you're looking to uh, follow me, I have uh, my blog on Pete McCall Fitness. Um, I have a podcast on iTunes. The podcast just I released has uh, Todd Durkin. I'm going to be recording my uh, recording um, my podcast with Derek about Active Motion Bar in, in another couple of weeks. We'll have that up there. About the benefits, Instagram, uh, you see the contact information up there. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I think we got a couple minutes uh, try to get you done right about the hour. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah, Pete, I think uh, there are a couple questions, so I'll go ahead and maybe call them out to you if you want to answer them. Um, sure. First of all, there's quite a few people who asked if you have the exercises that you showed, so maybe we can direct people to your uh, YouTube channel probably, right? Yep, the YouTube channel is All About Fitness Podcast. So if you do All About Fitness Podcast, if you search for that on YouTube, I think I have, uh, when, I, when I upload those videos uh, yesterday, Derek, I think I have 22 or 23. Um, I think of all the videos up there, I have like 20 active motion videos up there. You can also go to the active motion bar, um, active motion bar YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is All About Fitness Podcast is my YouTube channel. And um, I'll be putting more up there in the, in the days going forward. Cool. Good deal, yeah. Just a few more questions, Pete. Um, one person asked, you know, you mentioned how crawling and being down on the floor and just moving like a baby almost can help reset the central nervous system. People are asking um, if you have any suggestions for those clients who have limited mobility or injuries. Um, I know that's pretty general, but do you have any ways that you like to work with people uh, if they're limited in that sense? That and that's a good point. You can use the wall on that point because what you want to do is have some kind of closed chain feedback where your hands are in contact, hands and feet are in contact, and what you're trying to do is restrict um, motion in the spine. The benefit of being on the floor is that the the, the floor is supporting the spine, so um, the floor is supporting the spine, so that way you don't need to work against gravity. You know, it's uh, but you know it's just tough to do depending on what their limitation, their injury. But once they're down there, they'll find they can do a lot of range of motion. Because with clients that have hip issues, putting them on the floor to roll and, and develop the pattern, you know, without gravity by doing some hip flexion extension issues can really help improve their ability to squat once they're back up and standing. Yeah, no, that's a. I think that's a great point. Yep, perfect. Okay, cool. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna read Dina's question next. Uh, she is. Um, really asking about um, you know the more deeper internal stabilizers of the body the ones that support the spine and pelvis and she says you know what about those areas how you know and she asked specifically with the active motion bar you know how does that affect those deeper more you know non-surface tissues um, it, it, what it does is we, when, when you have a shifting mass, what it's going to do is get all the muscle, all the muscle and connective tissue involved. So when you look at like the, the multifidi muscles, when you look at the what are the go-go queens, the gemellus and the obturators of the hips, um, the gemellus superior inferior and the obturators internus externus, 
when you look at the smaller tissue muscles like that, it's really hard to do that with just an isolated action. And But when you move and you shift and you have a shifting mass, as the mass shifts, it's going to pull on the tissue, and that pulling motion is going to get all the connective tissue in between, get that more engaged and more activated. So with, with clients that maybe don't have great spinal stability, you know, doing some, some work on the ground where they're laying on the ground and just playing with the active motion bar, and they have to learn how to reflexively stabilize, because those are also muscles. I can't tell you to, to activate your um, transverse, you know, I, can, I can't tell you to activate your, your lumbar multifidi. I can't tell you to activate your rotatories, but, but those are muscles that connect from one vertebrae to another. So they're very short and have short, short moment arms. But if you do something reactive where you're holding a, an active motion bar overhead and you're moving it from side to side or shifting directions, those muscles will turn on automatically to create the stability necessary to hold your shoulders and your arms relatively stable. Any other questions there? Uh-oh, did I lose Derek? What did you guys lose me? Can you, can you hear me, Pete? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, okay? I got you. Okay, I know, I'm sorry. I don't know I if I, I lost you or you lost me. <laughs> I think I accidentally hit a button here. Um, one, one more question, actually. Uh, actually, no, maybe two. Um, uh, and this is one that we've been getting more and more of lately, I think, because of the, the similarities in focus with the education. But uh, Kelly asks, you know, what's the difference between doing these movement patterns with a Viper and doing one, doing them with the active motion bar? I mean, I, I, uh, that's, you know, while I think the education is very similar in that it's encouraging 3D movement and, um, you know, really the integration of the entire body working as one unit. I think just the main difference from the products just on the surface is the fact that, you know, there's a shifting mass and there's a static mass, right? I don't know if you want to... No, that's absolutely that. right. And, and, and just in the interest of full disclosure, um, I've been a, been a master trainer for, for Viper and, and I've done uh, some work with Institute of Motion, so I know the, those guys very well. And as much as I love um, love the Viper, it is a relatively static mass. And what it, what, what it does allow you to do is, is the handles on the Viper allow you to change the length. And the, and the change in length will put a different response on the tissue. But what the active motion bar does is because 30% um, of the mass of each bar is, is dynamic, meaning it moves and it shifts. So when you move into a range of motion like that offset lunge I showed, as the weight shifts and as the weight moves, and it catches, it's going to pull on the fascia and connective tissue. So it creates just a slightly different stimulus, and especially if you change the grip up to create a longer lever with the active motion bar. When you create a longer lever, it really, um, when you create a longer lever, it really does create more pull on the tissue and get more muscles, get more fibers involved, and so you get a greater overall tissue response. That's why, I mean, that, that research that, that, that active motion bar sponsored, they found there's 170% more activity is because more of the connective tissue is being engaged which um, than, than when using standard static bars, which don't have a shifting mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a good good way to put it, Pete. Yep. Um, just in the name of time, one more quick question. I think this might this was asked a few times. What do you mean by the six-pack is built in the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's where I need my work, as you can see from the videos. Um, what it means is just that you know, it is a lot of a lot of people carry abdominal fat in various areas. Um, you know, from the videos that that I, that I displayed, obviously I carry mine a little bit more in, in the abdominal viscera. So six pack being made in the kitchen means you control your your nutritional input. If you're really worried about a six pack or really worried about getting shredded, it's as much nutrition and, and, and making sure you're eating, making the right nutritional choices as it is exercise. Because exercise, only, only the only thing you're doing is you're activating certain muscles. Um, but if you're really trying to lose weight, if you're really trying to improve definition, then what works best is, or what tends to work best from um, just anecdotal experience in the research, is controlling your nutritional intake. And it's not necessarily quantity, but it's also quality. And how's your body burning it? And nutrition starts getting into such a um, gnarly area because there's so many different variables about that. Everybody can respond to the same nutrition program differently. 
So, but just understand that the whole idea of the six packs are made in the kitchen is it really comes down to controlling um, volume, meaning amount of calories and quality um, of calories. Yeah, great. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the, the questions. And just in the name of, uh, you know, getting people out of here on time, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. So any last uh, final thoughts, Pete? Main thing is just, you know, train the body how to move. We're all meant to move. And, and it really has been, um, you know, watching my kids learn how to move has really been eye-opening. I've studied movement for years, but watching them learn how to move and seeing that so much of this stuff, there's so much of good quality movement is reflexive, meaning that, you know, it, it happens where we can't really coach it. Um, all we can do is try to set up the environment so it becomes more successful. So just take a step back and look at your program and say, Am I helping my clients move more successfully? And if you are, then you're doing the right things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, that's going to wrap things up, you guys. Thanks so much for attending. Uh, thanks, Pete, for delivering this awesome presentation. Just, to, just in case you guys don't know, you know, Pete delivers his content at some of the biggest fitness conferences in the world. So we really are privileged to have him uh, doing this here. And I hope all of you got some some great value out of it. Um, We'll continue delivering these webinars on a monthly basis, so stay tuned. If you're looking for more exercise content, aside from uh, Pete's YouTube channel, which you should definitely go check out, uh, the Active Motion Bar website is full of exercises, uh, complete with instruction, very similar to the ones Pete uh, is delivering that uh, you know, also can be used to help guide you and your training as well as uh, you know, your coaching abilities when you're using Active Motion Bars and doing other exercises with your clients. Um, so thank you again, Pete, thank you for your time, and uh, I think we are going to sign off now. This, this will be available in a recording and sent to all you guys in the next few hours, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, Pete's information is right here on the screen, or you can reach out to Active Motion Bar through our website or email admin at activemotionbar.com. All right, thank you very much, you guys. Have a great day. Thanks a lot. Have a joy.